Good afternoon. Welcome everybody to our webinar, to our small ELI online seminar on uh, the concept and the role of courts in uh, family and uh, succession matters. Uh, my name is Anatol Dutta and I will chair this uh, small session over the next uh, about uh, 60, 60 minutes. Yeah, just um, uh, a few words um, on, on, on housekeeping matters. Uh, we welcome, of course, uh, the attendees of this uh, session and uh, we are welcoming questions uh, from the from the audience if you want to to to, to pose a question uh, please uh, use the um, i think it's called q and a button yeah the q and a button uh, of zoom uh, use this device and uh, send us uh, your your question we will have a q and a session in the end after the uh, presentations uh, within uh, this uh, panel by our panelists. Yeah, Katja, I think I haven't forget any, any other technical matter. And uh, if not, uh, I think we can start. Yeah, before we will listen to the presentation or presentations of our panelists, um, I would like uh, to, to give you some background information about uh, the topic of our small seminar. Uh, the topic, uh, the concept and the role of courts in family and uh, succession matters. This uh, topic is the object of a ELI uh, project uh, conducted by Elena, Francois and uh, my, myself. The project uh, was, and we are very happy about this, was approved uh, by the council just uh, recently and uh, the main output of this uh, project will be yeah, a small policy paper after we have finalized uh, the, the project. Why do we think uh, that the topic, the topic concept and um, um, the concept uh, of uh, and role of courts in family and succession matters, why do we think that uh, this topic is worth uh, thinking? about um, uh, why do we think that this topic is, is interesting. Um, the reason for our, um, for our research and for launching the project was uh, aware recent developments in, in many member states, but not only in member states of the European Union, also beyond the European Union, recent uh, developments um, where the legislature, the national legislators uh, shift um, competences in the area of family and uh, succession law from courts to other authorities, be it notaries or civil status officers, or shift even the administration of justice to them, to the parties themselves. If, uh, if we look, for example, to divorce law, where we have a renaissance of private divorces within uh, the European Union, but even also beyond the European Union. Those uh, developments, um, we think, uh, do not uh, pose that much questions if you look to the legal system itself. Of course, uh, there arise questions of the rule of law and the protection of, of weaker parties. Uh, of course, the protection of weaker parties is best handled by courts uh, who um, are competent to apply uh, the law and uh, should not be left to the parties. But uh, the main problems we think of this uh, development, which is described by the Italians, I think quite nicely with a very complicated word. I hope I can pronounce it correctly. It's the de-juridizionalizzazione. De it's, 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 it's a wonderful word, but very difficult to pronounce. Um, we think that the, the, the main challenges of this development uh, are in the area of uh, private international law when it comes to cross-border cases, especially the European Union instruments in the area of family and succession law, which is mainly the succession regulation, but also in the area of family law, the Brussels 2A regulation, the Brussels 2B regulation recently, the Rome 3 regulation, uh, the maintenance regulation, but also of course the Europeanized, um, the Europeanized Hague Conventions, Hague uh, Maintenance Protocol, 
but um, Hague, um, also the Hague uh, Child Protection uh, Convention. Um, all those EU instruments, they mainly, they, they presuppose that still justice is mainly carried out by courts and not by other authorities, um, civil status officers, notaries, etc. And of course, not uh, by the parties um, themselves. Questions arise really on all levels of private international law covered by, by those, um, those instruments. Already the question of the applicable law here, the problem arises whether the uniform conflict rules apply to these new developments as well. This was um, the, the, the question uh, in, the, in the famous Sayuni decision of the Court of Justice of the European Union, where the Court of Justice decided, uh, as you all know, that uh, for a Syrian private divorce, the Rome 3 regulation does not apply. The conflict rules of the Rome 3 regulations do not um, apply. However, the European legislator reacted by the Brussels 2B reg regulation recently, where we have a very, very interesting new concept of recognition of uh, private divorces, a, a concept which, uh, yeah, I think um, opens, uh, gives, gives, gives rise to many, 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 many questions, difficult questions. Is it a conflict rule? Is it a procedural rule? What exactly is this new, this new concept of recognition of private uh, divorces? Also on the jurisdictional level, we have uh, many, many different difficult um, questions. The question especially whether the jurisdictional rules apply at all to um, if, if justice is done by other authorities or by the parties themselves. We had the famous Oberle decision of the Court of Justice on national certificates of succession, uh, the German uh, Erbschein, the German um, certificate of succession issued by a German court where the court came to the conclusion that the jurisdictional provisions of the uh, succession regulation apply. Uh, but we had, have had uh, also um, the WB uh, and the EE uh, decision recently of the Court of Justice where, um, yeah, the, from, from, from those decisions one could infer that, um, that the jurisdictional provisions do not apply uh, if such a certificate with same effects as a German certificate is issued by a Polish or by a Lithuanian um, notary. The problem is evident. We have potentially contradictory certificates um, of uh, succession in the European Union because only one member state is bound by the jurisdictional provisions, the other isn't. Uh, and um, uh, we have, of course, maybe a conflict of uh, certificates. There is a possible solution to this. Um, we have the solution in the new Brussels to BIS regulation, where the legislator extends the jurisdictional provisions, the jurisdictional provisions of the, the, of, of the, of the regulation also to private divorces. Of course, we have also difficult questions um, on the level of recognition and, um, and enforcement. Here the question arises whether the recognition and enforcement provisions apply at all, if not a court is involved, but other authorities. Uh, this is even a question which goes beyond uh, European private international law, uh, for example, in the area of uh, surrogacy, um, um, the legal parenthood, uh, the legal parenthood of the commissioning parents is uh, established in one, some legal systems, for example, California, by a court decision. In other jurisdictions, like Ukraine, for example, it's, um, it's established by the operation of law, but certified in a birth certificate issued by a civil status officer. And here the question arises, do the recognition provisions apply to such a certificate as well? Uh, no, said recently was 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 the was the was the decision recently by the German Federal Court of Justice. I think yes was the answer by the Austrian Supreme Court, or at least a little bit different answer than the answer delivered by the German courts. Yeah, so many many interesting and complicated questions for private international lawyers, which uh, will be um, addressed by the speakers of our panel, which I would like uh, to, to introduce um, briefly to our audience. 
Um, the first intervention will be done by Elena Bargelli, who is also a member of our project um, team. Elena is a professor of uh, private law at the University of uh, Pisa. She was a research fellow of the Humboldt uh, Foundation at the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg. I think that's also the time when we both met. And uh, she is a member of the ELI Council and the membership uh, committee, and she is the chair of the special interest group um, in the area of family and succession law. The second speaker will be Francois Tremosa. Uh, he is also a member of our team. Francois is um, or has been a notary since uh, 1998 in Toulouse. He is the former president of the succession working group of the uh, notaries uh, of Europe. And uh, most importantly for us, he was a member of the expert group of the European Commission on the succession regulation. And I think he was also a member of the committee drafting the European certificate of um, succession. Yeah, we are very, very proud that um, Matthias Neumeyer joined um, our panel to add, uh, a, uh, to add an, an external perspective on our project and on our um, topic. Matthias Neumeyer is a professor of law at the University of Salzburg, but he is uh, for many years also a judge in, in Austria. He is since 2001. Um, uh, a judge at the Austrian uh, Supreme Court. Yeah, Herr Hofrat, we are very glad that you joined our session. Yeah, I think uh, that should suffice uh, as an introduction and I hand over now to Elena for her presentation. She is mainly dealing with the family law perspective of our topic. Elena. You have to turn on the microphone. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anatole, for giving me the floor. I would like to share with you uh, the, the slides uh, I have uh, prepared, which um, are no. Um, sorry for, okay, now they should be visible, okay, can you see them, can you see them, okay, thank you. Uh, as Anatole has anticipated, my presentation will focus on the concept and role of courts in family uh, matters. Uh, I, my, my, the aim of my presentation is to give an insight of uh, some questions uh, the um, ELI project will deal with, uh, and therefore I apologize in advance with the audience for uh, not providing an in-depth analysis uh, of the matters. The um, first issue to clarify um, is what a private divorce is. Uh, if we look at uh, a comparative overview of the jurisdictions that enacted non-judicial divorces in the last decade, uh, it can be said that a private divorce presupposes a uh, the agreement between the spouses, that means that uh, the unilateral uh, dissolution, um, the unilateral will uh, of a spouse is insufficient to terminate the marriage unless the uh, uh, unilateral dissolution is declared by a proper court. Uh, B, the lack of a judicial claim and a competent judge to give effect to the dissolution of the marriage, and C, and more importantly, the involvement of a state authority other than a judge. This third requirement allows, to, allows us to, to, to differentiate a private divorce, uh, which might be um, better denominated non-judicial or the jurisdictionalized uh, divorce um, 
from the near private divorces which pre-existed in, in, in third countries and uh, which not do not require uh, the involvement of a state authority. Um, of as, as Anatole has, 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 has said, um, um, the, the Court of Justice dealt with this kind of uh, divorces in a very well-known judgment, the Saihuni in 2000, 2017, um, when it stated that mere uh, private divorces do not fall within the scope of Rome III. Uh, the recast of Brussels II uh, A has confirmed this, uh, this, this line of thought. And as Anatole has said, um, uh, has excluded um, mere private divorces from the scope of Brussels II B and from the application of the recognition mechanism there provided. That said, uh, we have not um, even uh, a precise definition of private divorce. Uh, the, the, the definition I have given uh, is, remains very generic because it does not reveal which, what substantial and procedural requirements are needed for a private divorce to be valid. For instance, what kind of public authority is involved on the basis of a comparative analysis, we can see that the um, public authorities involved may be very different. Whether uh, the intervention, the public intervention is optional or mandatory, and more importantly, whether it is declaratory or constitutive. Um, to be precise, even the dividing line between uh, declaratory and constitutive intervention um, has become uh, difficult to trace, as most pri private divorces are indeed agreements which can be avoided due to vices of consent, incapacity of the parties, uh, and challenged by uh, contractual remedies, but at the same time, they have the same effects as a judgment according to the applicable uh, national law. Uh, then this, it must be said that, that this uh, dividing line between uh, declaratory and constitutive intervention has become the mode after the recast of uh, Brussels 2A. And then there are further variable elements, uh, whether, for instance, the control is purely formal or requires the facts to be scrutinized and the interest to be assessed, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, private divorces did not show up out of the blue. They are uh, a, a, a small part of a broader trend uh, which in family law, which um, is often described as, as privatiz private privatization uh, of family law, um, often by using the motto from status to contract um, as regards the privatization of, of, of divorce, the comparative analysis shows that it is uh, composed uh, by um, several uh, changes, uh, like the, the spread of no fault divorce, the easement of its procedure, the dilution of its substantial requirements, the increased role of mutual consent, and the decreasing importance of public policy. Conflict of law rules have follow it parallel a parallel trend at, at both national and EU uh, levels. Um, the first logical step is to identify the role uh, of courts in the dissolution of marriage according to uh, the, the traditional role of courts in the dissolution of marriage. The courts serve often uh, usually serve uh, a double function, a formal, formal functions and substantial functions. Many formal functions among which the, judg the judgment serves as public instrument, giving legal certainty to, to divorce and granting its circulation. Court 
is a concept strictly related with that of jurisdiction. As to the substantial functions, they are mainly related to the protection of vulnerable members of the family. And under this respect, judicial proceeding is seen as a guarantee of the fundamental rights and principles involved, and the court is seen as guarantor of the fairness of the family arrangement after the marriage dissolution with particular regard of, uh, of maintenance rights and custody. Um, how did the EU <coughs> uh, respond to the replacement of formal functions by non-judicial authorities? The EU um, enacted Brussels to, uh, to, to be uh, and provided, first of all, a broader definition of court, uh, which embraces not only judiciary, judiciaries and administrative authorities, but also other authorities like notaries. More importantly, uh, it, um, it provided, um, it, it stated uh, um, that uh, it, it provides for the circulation of authentic instruments and agreements and uh, submitted uh, them under the same uh, rules governing the recognition and enforcement of, enforcement of judgments, provided that certain requirements are given and safeguards. Uh, I will focus on, um, uh, I, I, um, uh, I mention only the fifth, the party seeking the recognition has to request a certificate before the competent authority in the state of origin. As to the replacement of substantial functions by non-judicial authorities, I will focus uh, on the hearing of, of the children. Um, I will not deal with uh, other uh, uh, substantial functions of the court and family matters, in particular, the economic protection of the weaker spouse um, is entirely left to the autonomy of the member uh, states and does not raise any uh, public policy uh, issue. Uh, of course, it raises concern uh, at national comparative level um, because, of course, uh, the, um, especially when the uh, non-judicial non Authority, um, um, authorities intervention is only declaratory. Uh, the fairness of the agreement uh, is governed uh, only by contract law and remedies, but it, this is an issue I want to let as, to, to leave aside. Uh, as I said, I will focus on the hearing of the children, which is uh, an issue uh, at the crossroads of national and European law. Um, under this respect, the uh, Brussels 2B um, makes clear that the recognition of decision relating to parental responsibility may be refused if it was given without the child who is capable of forming his or, or her views, having been given the opportunity to fix his or her view. Of course, this does not mean, according to the European Court of Justice case law, or previous case law, that the hearing constitutes an absolute obligation. Um, uh, uh, in fact, as the recital um, uh, 39 makes clear, uh, it is not necessary that the court, uh, the court um, um, uh, provides for the hearing of the, of the child in every case, but it is necessary that where that court decides to provide the opportunity for the child to be heard, it takes all the appropriate me measure. Uh, this principle is echoed at national level where it is controversial that 
the agreement between parents on the divorce um, and its terms may make the hearing of the children unnecessary or even contrary to their interest if the agreements are fair and the need to relieve the children of the emotional distress caused by the divorce prevails. So, um, which is the role uh, left to national courts. The role is huge because uh, Brussels 2B leaves to national law and procedure the power to uh, choose who will hear the minor and how the child is heard. Uh, the court of authority competent to issue certificates, um, the choice of the, of the court of authority competent to issue the, uh, the certificate is left again to member states, which shall communicate uh, the court of the authority to the commission. Uh, the uh, Annex 9 points out only that in issuing the certificate, the public authorities must check and declare whether the children were capable of forming their view, and if so, uh, whether they were given a, a genuine and effective opportunity to express their view. So, uh, let, um, uh, um, we can uh, uh, make the case, we can cite uh, the case of Italy and France, which are very well known uh, by the um, family law experts. Um, just to see how different the role of the so-called so court can be uh, in one jurisdiction and another jurisdiction. In Italy, for instance, the competent public prosecutor has the power, who, who is competent to issue the certificate, has the power to refuse to endorse the divorce agreement due to the agreement being inconsistent with the best interest of the children and therefore Mm, likely, even if the, the, the law does not state it expressly, they right to be heard. This means that the court retains a degree of discretion and assesses or has the power to assess whether such a hearing is, appro was, is, appro is appropriate in the, in the um, actual case. In France, the divorce agreement is recorded by a notary and requires that the children with sufficient maturity do not request for their hearing. If this is the case, the notary forming the certificate will receive the parent's declaration that the child has been informed and freely renounced to his or her right. In this case, um, there does the court in this case, the notary has neither the power to assess uh, directly the maturity of the child nor to scrutinize the consistency of the custody arrangements with the best interest of the child, something which, of course, uh, raises uh, concern uh, as regards the effectiveness of the children for the mental uh, right, right to be heard. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to conclude um, to say that the, the functional approach to the concept of court chosen by, um, embraced by, by, by Brussels to be, is the easiest and most expected by uh, family law experts. Um, this approach reinforces the moral neutrality of the private inter international law instruments in matrimonial matters, but confirms the substantial requirements for the recognition of decisions in matters of parental responsibility. Crucial, um, the, the crucial and sensitive uh, question, uh, um, or, or, or several, there are <laughs> several crucial sensitive, sensitive questions arising. Uh, for instance, how the respect uh, of the child's right is verified, which means are available to challenge the certificate, and whether these are effective, um, especially taking into account what the European Court of Justice 
uh, said in 2010, uh, and therefore uh, before uh, the Rasta to be um, uh, was 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 enacted. Um, regarding Brussels 2A and the uh, authority competent uh, to, um, um, to uh, or, or, or better, the national, um, the, the, the authority competent uh, to, um, to, to check whether the fundamental right of the child to be heard um, did a good work. The uh, European Court of Justice in that occasion clarified that it is solely for the national court of the member states of origin. Yeah, forgive me, we are just yes. uh, running out of time a little bit. Oh yes, I'm, I'm, I'm concluding. Um, so the, the, the final question is whether uh, the shifting of the competence to issue the certificate to non-judicial authorities implies that this may consider it even be considered court under Article 2000 to 267 of the Treaty of the Function of the European Union. Thank you very much and sorry for this delay. Elena, thank you very much uh, for your excellent um, overview. As we are late, I will hand directly over to Francois and uh, to the perspective of uh, succession law. Francois. Thank you, Anatoly. You can hear me well, no? Yeah, uh, so, and I will, I will go on, so, oops, sorry, I do need to, I do need to because with the phone. Uh, so to go on, so what Elena was saying regarding private divorce um, and the recast of Brussels to A, uh, I totally agree with the, with the issue of the hearing of the child uh, in France uh, and now the French government has to decide who will hear the children. And there are two options. I mean, I guess three options or whichever options you can think of. Um, the court, and then it's not really a private divorce anymore because you have to go back to court. The notaire, that would be quite natural, but it might raise the concerns of avocat because it's merely an internal issue of market for each profession between notaires and avocat. Uh, avocats don't want notaires to be involved. Notaires are happy to do it, but they don't care. So, and the ministry is under the table because he doesn't want to be stuck uh, in between a war between two legal provisions. So that's, so we will see what will be decided at the end. So to go back to the topic of the concept of courts in uh, family and succession matters, um, unfortunately I don't have a structure presentation like Elena, um, but I was remembering the genesis of the European succession regulation. The question arose very early on regarding how to prove the quality of heirs. And of course, each national system had their own way and their own national certificate of inheritance. It could have been easy to say, well, great, each state has its own system. Let's all agree that everyone recognizes the national certificate drawn up by, no, by an authority from a different member state. But very early on, it appeared that this wouldn't work because some countries would not accept national proof coming from another country. Hence, the 28th regime, which is the European Certificate of Succession, um, established by the regulation with one regime for the whole uh, territory of the European Union. And it was decided uh, that the authority that would issue the, the European Certificate of Succession would be designated by each 
individual stage according to the organization of its uh, of each individual country and that that authority will be bound by the rules of competence of the regulation so for the european certificate of uh, succession it's easy everyone is bound by the same rule but when you open an inheritance you have an option between delivering a national certificate of inheritance or the European certificate of inheritance and in some countries the national certificate of succession is delivered by the judge hence the question in the WB case when a judge of a certain country delivers a large line, for instance, is he bound by the rules on jurisdiction? And the answer, as we all know, is yes. In EE, the question is roughly the same, except that this time it's not a judge who is delivering the national certificate of inheritance, it's a notary, so different authority. Is he bound by the rules on jurisdiction of the European regulation? And this time the answer is it depends. If the notary acts as a delegate of the court, then yes, he is bound. But if the notary doesn't act as a delegate of the court, it's not to be considered a jurisdiction ultimately, then he's not bound by the rules um, of the regulation. And to give you a concrete example, it's a case I had recently in the office. Uh, it's a French client who lived in Munich. He passed away. He was quite young. He was 40 years old. Um, he was living in Germany. So there were no doubt that the law applicable to his inheritance was German law. And there's no doubt that the only authority uh, competent to deliver the ECS was the local German court. Most of his estate was in France. He only had a bank account in Germany, but otherwise his estate was in France. And the question was, could I deliver a French national certificate of inheritance? The answer for me was yes, of course. I'm a notaire, I'm not in the French context, I am not a court, I'm not, I am not bound by the rules on jurisdiction uh, as uh, implemented by the regulation. So of course I can uh, deliver a French act de notoriété, which I did because it was easier and faster for me to deal with inheritance and separately we asked the German court to deliver uh, an ECS to deal with the German bank account. And now, in the symmetric situation, if it had been a German citizen passing away in France, French courts would have been, I mean, French notaire would have been competent both to deliver an ECS and an act de notoriété, but the German authority wouldn't have been able to deliver either. And of course, there, there is an imbalance that is surprising with which we may feel uncomfortable or not. I don't know, it depends what your history is and where you come from, uh, but there is something. And I guess that's the point of our project. What do we do in this type of situations? What is, what should be the most desirable solution uh, for rational reasons and if you take into account all of the stakeholders um, and mainly, of course, the heirs as a, and the situation of the heirs, because we want to simplify citizens' life. We don't want com to complicate it. So that's an open question. I don't have an answer, um, but that's really the point that I wanted to make of the question I wanted to ask today. Thank you. Bonsoir, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent 
illustration of our, our project. Um, by one example only, one could make different examples in other areas of law as well. Uh, for example, in uh, divorce law, uh, where as well, the question arises, what happens if uh, in Italy, we have a private divorce pending or there's a process of a private divorce? Of course, a private divorce cannot be pending because it's not pending somewhere, but there is a process of a private divorce. And at the same time, there is in a German court, uh, there are court proceedings uh, on divorce. Who is coordinating those uh, two procedures? They are, one is a procedure, the other is something privately. Yeah, that's exactly, that are exactly the questions uh, we would like to answer and uh, to give um, a policy uh, a recommendation in the end, how the European legislator could deal with those, um, those, those problems. Yeah, um, let me hand over to our last um, speaker on the, on the panel, uh, to Matthias Neumeyer, who will now give the outsider and uh, practitioner perspective. Uh, thank you, Anatol, for giving me uh, giving me the floor, and thank you for the inv invitation to this uh, webinar. Uh, I have uh, prepared three slides, and uh, Katja will present them for me. Uh, when I prepared uh, for my statement, uh, I googled the word dejurisdictionalization, and I already knew from the feasibility study that uh, the word is derived from the Italian language. In fact, uh, Google uh, search showed me that uh, mainly Italian authors deal with the phenomenon. So it's now time to observe the phenomenon from a broader perspective. Uh, may I first refer to the uh, Austrian experience? Uh, since about the middle of the 19th century, uh, succession proceedings uh, have been outsourced to notaries in Austria. Uh, this was not an Austrian invention, but uh, Austria followed the French model. Uh, the notary acts on behalf of the court as a so-called court commissioner. Uh, the distribution uh, of tasks between the court and the notary is as follows. Uh, the notary prepares everything and also tries to reach agreements in the event of disagreement between heirs or uh, legatees. Uh, the decision on the substance uh, of the matter is then made by the court. And nevertheless, uh, it is fully recognized that the notary as a court commissioner acts uh, in a sovereign function. Uh, we therefore see a first essential difference, which has also been worked out in the previous case law of the European Court of Justice. The rule of court is primarily based on the fact that the decision can also be made against the will of a party involved. Uh, a lot of topics I wanted to mention uh, have already been uh, treated uh, by Elena and uh, Francois, so I uh, may be uh, short. Uh, so this system of uh, notaries uh, working as a, uh, court commissioners in um, succession uh, matters is well established in Austria and it is not being questioned. It is therefore interesting for me to see that uh, there is little tendency in Austria to outsource matters such as a divorce by mutual agreement to other bodies. Perhaps it is simply a question of cost. For the parties involved, the costs are cheaper, uh, uh, the, the costs before a court are cheaper than before a notary, for example. Uh, so Katja, would you turn over the next slide? Uh, other countries are known to be much more liberal in this respect, such as Estonia, where a couple can be divorced in three different places, at the registry office, at the notary, and in court. Here is the first suggestion. It makes sense to me to integrate the experiences made in Estonia uh, more into the project. Uh, of course, we are also confronted with the phenomenon of out-of-court uh, out divorces in Austria. Uh, if, for example, Anatol mentioned it just before, the marriage of an Austrian woman is divorced before a French notary at her place of residence in Strasbourg. And if this Austrian woman returns to her home country and wants to enter into a new marriage here, the registrar in Austria will have to ask him or herself how to deal with the divorce in France. We would certainly handle this problem rather liberally in Austria. And this leads to the next questions. What about out-of-court divorces in third countries? So to say the Sayuni case. 
Uh, first of all, I have to say that in Austria, unlike in Germany, for example, uh, we have always tried to treat cases uh, relating to a third country in the same way as cases relating to an EU member state. We must therefore ask ourselves how to deal with the divorce certificate issued, for example, by a religious authority in third country. Um, as my time is limited, I do not want to dwell on this very interesting Sayuni question. Uh, so Katya, would you please be so kind to change the slide? Uh, more generally, I believe that the most important value of the project will be in the area of recognition and enforcement particularly in this distinction between judgments and authentic instruments. Uh, this is particularly evident in the new process to tear regulation. The definition of court is very broad. I quote, um, court means any authority in any member state with jurisdiction in the matters falling within the scope of, the re of this regulation. Uh, one might be inclined to say that the European legislator simply takes note of the new development of de-jurisdictionalization, almost capitulates to it and designates all authority, all, all of the authorities acting within the scope of the regulation as courts. This idea is not new, we already know it from the 1996 Hague Convention. The new process to tear regulation, the European legislator still maintains the distinction between decisions and authentic instruments, but applies the same grounds for refusal of recognition to authentic instruments as to decisions. Uh, there, be, there would still be much more to say, especially with regard to the definition of court, which played a role not only in the WE decision and the EE decision on the European succession regulation, uh, which has already been mentioned several times, but also, for example, in the a parking case which was decided on the Brussels I regulation. Uh, I would like to stop now for reasons of time to sum up. I consider the project to be very important uh, from a legal dogmatic as well as a legal sociological point of view. I consider the area of recognition uh, to be particularly important in order to a great, uh, greater legal certainty in Europe. So, Thank you, and I would be absolutely glad to answer your questions. But yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, kind response uh, to, to our ideas. Uh, we are very glad that uh, also from an external perspective, it appears uh, a good idea to pursue our, our questions. Yeah, we are behind a schedule, but nevertheless, we have, uh, if my the time is uh, correct uh, displayed on my laptop. We have uh, eight minutes, uh, or no, uh, six minutes for questions uh, and, and answers. Um, we had already one uh, comment. Uh, uh, I hope I can manage the F and A button uh, correctly. And uh, I think Francois already grabbed the question. Is correct? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's correct. Uh, I, that's more than I don't know how to use the system, uh, more than I wanted to grab the question per se. Um, yeah, yeah, you can hear me, I'm not on mute. Um, I'm not sure I agree with Sabine. Uh, what happens today is that de facto, for four days, Deliver. Uh, Francois, could you maybe uh, 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 read out or at least tell the content, I think, of the, of the comment? Because I don't know whether the attendees can see the F&A tool we can see. Ah, okay, sorry. I thought everyone could see the comment I don't of Sabine. Know. Sabine was saying, I am afraid that European Union states uh, will go back to their own attitude. Act de notoriété for a state in France, of buying for a state in Germany, and so forth. Um, I'm not they sure can see it. Uh, today, the ECS is delivered only when we don't have a choice. Otherwise, each authority prefers to deliver its own national certificate. Uh, having said so, I don't know, the fact of the ECS 
is not functioning properly in the sense that very few are delivered. Definitely, I guess, practitioners would prefer for each member state to actually accept their national certificate. But at the same time, today is not an option. So, yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francois. Uh, now we have a question by Katarina Bulevelki um, on the methodology of uh, our project. Yeah. It's always difficult, I think, uh, as a lawyer to, <laughs> to describe uh, the own methodology if you think you have a good idea to pursue. Um, I think, um, first of all, we would like in our policy paper to focus mainly on the European Union level and try to, to improve, uh, to try to improve uh, the, uh, the, 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 the instruments of the European Union in the area of uh, family and succession law to deal with uh, these conflicts and uh, these uh, and these problems. Um, from the methodology, we are, yeah, I think, rather chaotic and simply discussing the issues uh, which we uh, which we which we see. Um, we have no plan at the moment to to um, to to broaden our scope and to look in more, into more details of the national legal systems. We would like to do this in a second step. Once we uh, once we see clearer on the European Union level, uh, we would like, uh, and if we get the funding, we will do it uh, to to go into the details and to check really by the member states' legal systems, by the details of the member state legal systems, whether our ideas and our proposals for reform of the European instruments would work there as well. Yeah, I'm always very, it's always, for me, it's always difficult to talk to about methodology. I hope uh, this uh, answers uh, the question, but maybe Elena, maybe she can say a few words as well on methodology, if she likes. You have to turn on your microphone, Elena. Sorry, yeah. Uh, well, as regards this first phase of the project, uh, the methodology, well, uh, is just um, consists in, in, in uh, uh, drafting uh, a list of questions, of relevant questions, on the basis of the um, case law by the, the European Court of, Court of Justice and the latest developments, um, uh, legislative developments to uh, a, 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 a range of experts in the field and discuss them and, um, and this is a methodology based on, 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 on a questionnaire. And then of course the second phase will be more systematic if it will be of course um, done um, upon the condition that there will be funds and so on and so forth. Great, thank you. Yeah, Jens uh, Scherpe, um, very interesting point, uh, whether um, the whole development shifting administration of justice in family succession law to non-courts, whether this uh, leads in a loss of precedent and a lot of a lot, uh, loss of development of the law. Yeah, I think this is the general concern against this, um, this uh, development, but we will try to focus mainly in a first step on the private international law issues uh, because they are from from a cross-border perspective uh, those problems are really really pressing but this is a really really mm -hmm. good point i haven't uh, thought of so far um, my concern was mainly so far that the rule of law is not protected anymore um, if, uh, if 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 those uh, those areas where traditionally courts operated are done by the parties themselves private divorces uh, or also parentage and uh, not by by courts um, anymore, but um, yeah, we will. I will make a footnote, uh, and and uh, I will. Um, I think we will address. Hopefully, in the second phase, we will address this uh, this concern mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, um, Renate Schaub, um, the scope of our research. Which instruments are we covering? Um, the Adult um, uh, Protection Convention is not formally at the moment a EU instrument, so we I think we will leave it at, aside at the moment because we want to formulate policy considerations for a reform of the existing European instruments. Of course, there are plans uh, or there's the idea to Europeanize also this convention. Um, 
if this uh, this is this will happen of course it would be part of our considerations yeah, yeah. elena do you want to or francois would you want to add something uh, to those two questions Jens Scherpes and renate schaub if not i think francois the next question is for you um. Richard. Thank, you, and thank you, Richard, for asking that question. Uh, I don't think I agree with you. Um, for the ECS, everyone is bound by the rules on jurisdiction uh, as stated by the regulation, and the players are played without any difficulties. Uh, in my view, the problem comes from, from the fact that national certificates are not accepted in all countries. Um, and I think you can't say that the UK opted out because of that problem. Uh, I think the UK opted out for many reasons. And I remember the first meeting of uh, the expert group, everyone really agreed to say that the UK ultimately will opt out. So. I don't see the correlation there between the UK opting out and the circulation of the ECS or the rules on delivering the national certificate of miracles. Hmm. Yeah, but the, really the problem, the problem is, um, uh, it's really a really borderline and very, very intricate problem. How far do we apply the jurisdictional rules to, to notaries? Of course, we won't apply those rules when the notary only set up the will or, 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 or is, 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 is uh, supporting making the will. But when, when is the point where we have to say the notary is acting as a court uh, and, and is bound by the jurisdictional provisions? I think Francois in his presentation really showed the problem. We have the problem that, for example, we have a, 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 um, a, a Polish uh, certificate of succession by a Polish notary, which says A, and we have a German uh, certificate of succession uh, issued by a German court, which is bound, definitely bound, according to Oberle, by the jurisdictional provision saying B. And this is really something uh, we have to deal with. Uh, I think maybe one solution could be to apply Article 64 of the succession regulation by analogy, uh, uh, and uh, to force the Polish uh, notaries, the French notaries, to uh, apply when issuing certificates of succession under national law to apply uh, the jurisdictional provisions of the regulation. But this will be definitely discussed in our, in our project. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, time, time is up. It's uh, three, two. Um, thank you very much uh, for attending. Our, our online uh, seminar. Um, I, I didn't expect that much attendees. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent uh, questions. And uh, yeah, hope to see you soon in, in the real world again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.